When it comes to most games, I think I would consider myself to be a pretty casual player. There are some exceptions, though, and among those seldom few titles, the Metro games might reign supreme. So far as Metro is concerned, I would pretty readily consider myself a hardcore fan, mostly because I have only ever played the games on Ranger Hardcore difficulty, so that pretty much does the speaking for me. I've beaten each entry in the trilogy quite a few times over with no UI while constantly outgunned and often surrounded by dozens of deadly enemies. I've played all the way through Metro Exodus almost exclusively using throwing knives. This series captivated me years ago with its oppressive atmosphere, brilliantly bleak environmental design, and deceptively hopeful narrative. Artyom's adventures through the post-apocalyptic Moscow metro system and beyond make for some of my favorite gaming experiences of all time. But during all that time I spent enjoying those games, I had always been acutely aware that these titles had a jankier, slightly mutated older brother. The beloved predecessor, with much the same talent behind the scenes, Stalker. From what I knew, Stalker seemed to appeal to a certain type of person. So far as I can tell, it's all too likely that the very same person who first told you something like, No, no, trust me, this stuff is good to smoke, is also a major Stalker fan. Yet over the years, I've seen fans of the series place these games on a pedestal, denoting them as all-time classics. A distinct and inspired creation, appreciated by the few but known by the many. I've always wanted a chance to play through these revered experiences for myself, doubly so given the upcoming Stalker 2, which looks to be a truly phenomenal production throughout the preview material we've seen thus far. That was always just a dream, though. Stalker, especially the two earlier titles, sat in a weird limbo of sorts where one might find a few thousand enthusiasts at any given time, yet, somewhat tragically, absolutely zero console players. I had accepted long ago that these games were something I would only ever be familiar with in a vicarious sense. That is, until early in March, when seemingly, to everyone's surprise, these titles were quietly and unceremoniously ported to both current and last-gen consoles. The barriers had fallen. Finally, I had the opportunity which I had been awaiting for so long. Wasting no time, I downloaded all three games and began a new journey to discover exactly what I had been missing out on. First off, I badly wanted to know, does Stalker hold up after all these years, or is its rust starting to show? And even then, are these games still worth playing for other reasons? Those are the questions I'll be answering in this video. Now, before I begin, obviously these versions I'm playing are relatively vanilla, though there has been some upscaling applied and additional bug fixes and stability patches. Some might not consider this to be the real version of Stalker, and that's totally cool. I understand that modability is a massive part of these games appeal for a lot of players out there. At this time, that's not an option on my end, so this version of Stalker is about as real as it gets for me and all of my opinions in this video pertain to these particular releases. Cool? Cool. Let's dive into the zone. So, here's where it all began. The legacy started here with Shadow of Chernobyl, which released all the way back in 2007, and yeah, it kind of shows. That's not to discount the many moments of stark beauty which occurred throughout my time with this title, but between the stiff animations and the static lighting, things can definitely end up appearing a bit visually dated here. When you add in the purposefully clunky shooting and more punishing RPG elements, like an inability to repair any of your gear, ever, I'm afraid many players will swiftly turn away from Shadow of Chernobyl without giving it a full opportunity to reveal its best elements. And that's too bad, because there's so much to appreciate here. The beginning was admittedly a bit of a struggle, but after the first hour or so of hoboing about, killing bandits and shooting at dogs, I started to comprehend the UI and the complex control scheme. I got a feel for the movement and rhythm of this game. There's a lot to it, but honestly, I found that the controls reported to console really well, so I didn't struggle for too long. Suddenly, I felt that mystical appeal I often saw mentioned online. There is a genuinely unique atmosphere to be found here, where the unknown awaits around every corner, monsters creep in the shadows, and bullets could start flying at any moment. The zone, while dated in its layout, is full of detail and hidden secrets and loot to be had for those willing to risk a little skin. 
I love when all these elements come together to make a unique experience and adventure all your own, which happens pretty much every time you step into the zone. That unpredictability is where Shadow of Chernobyl, or SOC's, secret sauce comes in. The A-Life system, a proprietary AI. All the beasts and mutants and fellow stalkers in the zone act with A-Life's guidance, performing a varied routine that involves eating, sleeping, and resting. Doesn't sound like much on the surface, but this is definitely some of the most compelling tech under Stalker's hood. It brings a certain liveliness to this otherwise terribly stark landscape. Mutants hunt for food while Stalkers set out on various missions to defend territory or roam about seeking out artifacts, all by their own volition. Sometimes they get caught up in other dangers along the way. Pretty often, they die too. This system really works to provide the sense that this is a dynamic and dangerous world, where the player character isn't the sole actor, but instead one small piece of a greater whole. There's a whole predatory ecosystem out there, and you're caught in the middle of it. For all my love of the Metro games, they never quite managed to pull off anything this ambitious. Now, I could list all sorts of things that I think Metro pulls off better than Stalker, but the A-Life system is certainly a beast of all in its own. It reminds me of the best parts of games like Oblivion, or maybe even Half-Life, games where the developers had a vision of how to deliver fresh and unseen concepts to the medium. I honestly believe that without A-Life, Stalker wouldn't be half as memorable as it's grown to become over the years. Then we have the shooting. So it might feel god-awfully difficult to hit anything, but there's a lot to consider behind every pull of the trigger. Bullets have armor penetration and damage drop-off, they're pulled by gravity, your accuracy decreases when you're injured or low on stamina. Personally, I think all of this is great. It makes every shootout a tactical experience, and the reactivity the enemies display when shot in various limbs is pretty much as good as it gets, even today. Not to mention, it's super fun to send someone flying back with a shotgun, they totally nailed that bit. But there is an issue. Without headshots, enemies are super bullet spongy, and heavily armored enemies absurdly so. By the mid to end game, you're pretty much solely making use of weaponry which helps you to nail those headshots. This is fine, I suppose, but with all that simulation going into the shots and the impressive reactivity of your targets, it almost feels a shame to reduce the whole thing to a point and click adventure. As I continued through my playthrough, I noticed an interesting trend. SOC is pretty light on the quests. Usually the context for any given action is, Somebody went about a hundred meters from where you're standing and died. Go loot their body for some info and return to this spot or maybe move on to the next. To say it's lacking in substance compared to other contemporary RPGs like Fallout 3 would be an understatement. It's like a plate of whipped cream compared to a juicy steak. There's excellent exposition as stalkers and scientists explain the zone and its phenomena to you, but that isn't quest design by a long shot. The truth is, I don't think the devs had ever played a single decent session of D&D in their lives given the way the quests are structured in this game. There were some great set pieces and dungeons in the form of the notorious mutant-filled subterranean labs and the bandit camps, with well-designed and intense combat encounters throughout but my reasons for being there were few and far between. Mostly I was seeking out some documents, I guess. By the end, the main kill Strelok objective is potentially the only hook with some real density to it. To my surprise, I was reminded of an unexpected title while making my way through SOC, Old School RuneScape. There's something strangely similar about the world design, where locations like a toxic swamp are pretty much condensed to the very smallest version which would still qualify as fulfilling the overall idea. Two green pools of bubbling water, a bridge or two, and an island in the center. Boom! That's a toxic swamp. This concept is applied to nearly every overworld location, with most of the maps providing between 30 minutes to perhaps two hours of content in the end. Ultimately, I came to appreciate the breakneck pace of the game, due to how often I was placed in new environments and situations, but things were quickly wrapping up after about 10 hours of gameplay. Occasionally, SOC delivered on offering exhilarating action. Occasionally, it scared me so bad that I was shaking like this dude. The end was soon approaching, and I was well equipped to tackle it. Unfortunately, I found the climax of SOC is an arduous, drawn-out battle against heavily armored and armed enemies. 
you will die and die and get turned around and die some more in the process of overcoming this final series of missions. That's partly the desired vision, I think, but after struggling through those last moments, I breathed a sigh of relief knowing that I would never have to experience a finale quite this rough ever again. My opinions shifted many times throughout this experience, but when the credits rolled, I found I was quite satisfied with SOC as a whole. I could sense the long-term appeal fans make mention of, and I could picture myself replaying this from time to time in order to find a few more secrets and pull what can be pulled from this somewhat dated yet very special title. Then I launched the second of the Stalker games, Clear Sky, and in time I would learn what a truly frustrating ending looks like. Oh boy, Clear Sky is… a game! Actually, I think Clear Sky provides a better initial impression compared to its predecessor. The lighting is way more dynamic, the animations are smoother and more varied, and the gunplay is vastly improved. They even kick down the door with this exciting new faction system, which allows you to partake in battles over territory, fighting on the side of one faction or another, and assisting in their efforts. It marries super well with the A-Life system, which makes it so that every generic soldier really feels like a distinct character with a history and relationships of their own. Unfortunately, this system proves to be entirely squandered. The first hour and a half of Clear Sky is spent running around taking advantage of the faction wars, and then it subsequently fades straight out of existence like a distant bloodsucker. I found it interesting that there was an almost overcompensation of dialogue about these faction wars too. NPCs have a tendency to blather in Clear Sky, as though that might make up for the lack of quest design in the prior game. It doesn't really work. While many players might appreciate this additional exposition, there was still a plethora of overly simple objectives, often leaving me wishing for more. And while some RPG elements from the first game were vastly improved, like the ability to repair and upgrade your gear, others took a turn for the worse. One of the more interesting systems in Stalker has to do with equipping artifacts produced by the zone and its volatile terrain. These artifacts provide supernatural benefits, like unlimited stamina or accelerated healing. They almost all shed radiation, however, so to equip them in the first place takes an artifact which provides radiation resistance instead. Otherwise, you die. Not only this, but finding artifacts is often no easy feat to begin with, especially if you have no clue what you're doing, like myself. In SOC, artifacts just kind of bounce about on the ground near to environmental hazards. In Clear Sky, they do exactly the same, but now they're totally invisible. The only way you're capable of seeing them is by the use of a handheld device. While there's a certain believability to this process, it becomes very difficult to find yourself that first set of artifacts which really launch your build. Actually, it wasn't until the latter mid-game that I managed to equip any at all, leaving me constantly out of breath and disadvantaged as I traversed the zone. This was pretty damn annoying, especially considering the ever-increasing frequency of emissions, freak psychic storms which emanate from the center of the zone. If you're caught outside in one of these, you're done for, so you've got to find some decent cover and wait it out. A fun concept, unless you're constantly over-encumbered and looking to complete some objective on the far side of the map at that. It's for these reasons that I discovered some involved inventory management can make all the difference during your time with these games, so don't skimp out on planning ahead. And despite how often the changeability of the zone is mentioned, the map design is remarkably similar to SOC. Clear Sky did come out in 2008 after all, only one year after the release of Shadow of Chernobyl, so it's no surprise the vast majority of their work is reused. Many maps are lightly modified or expanded, and there are some new zones, as well as some which have been blocked off due to narrative implications. I don't believe this did enough to improve on the groundwork which SOC had lain, however. While some of the dungeons continued to be inspired in design, the overworld suffered from the same RuneScape-style effect I had mentioned before, leaving me feeling as though these bite-sized areas lacked in complexity. On the other hand, I can attest to Clear Sky providing a superior intro, which leaves you far better equipped to tackle the zone by the time the game really opens up. There's also greatly improved progression so far as your power level is concerned, as well as the challenges you face, and some occasionally interesting quests, with more to offer than, go loot that corpse over there, would you? 
Not only this, but the shooting model is vastly improved. While I learned to enjoy the sim-like inaccuracy of SoC, the battles in Clear Sky are smoother to play through right up until the very end. And the animation system is vastly improved as well. Enemies like the common dog are far more effective foes in Clear Sky as compared to SoC, where they could be kited around pretty much effortlessly. And that dynamic lighting I mentioned earlier is a huge improvement too. Sometimes I found myself thoroughly impressed by how well Clear Sky holds up graphically in some situations. By using one of the industry's earliest global illumination systems, shadows and lighting can be strikingly realistic, especially on the exterior of buildings as the sun begins to set. There was a decent handful of hours when I thought Clear Sky might outdo its predecessor, big time. Then, before you know it, everything comes to a screeching halt. When one might imagine themselves to be about two-thirds of the way through this game, you hit the point of no return. From here on, you will be punished with a series of brutal combat encounters against the monolith faction. Much like in the last game, headshots are pretty much your only option, unless you packed an absurd amount of ammunition. Your weapons will degrade, your armor will break, you will fight a completely worthless helicopter boss for some reason, and by the end, you will find yourself amidst the greatest clusterfuck of a final mission I have ever witnessed. Kill Strelok is a great objective in the first game, but it might be the worst in the second by the time the opportunity to actually pull the trigger on the guy rolls around. I adore how you are handed a railgun, much like the ones you used during the final missions of the Metro series, that is so, so cool. But goddamn, if it didn't take me an hour to have any sort of clue what the hell was going on here. Multiple times Strelok just disappeared, I guess, leaving me with no clue what to do next. By the time I figured it out, I was just happy to have finished things. And the idea of leaving Clear Sky behind sooner rather than later was all too appealing to ignore. While the game has its fans, I believe Clear Sky to be the weakest entry in the series. There's a charm to the imbalance of Shadow of Chernobyl, and I was soon to find that Call of Pripyat was on another league entirely, so by default Clear Sky kind of has to be the worst of them. That doesn't mean this sequel is a bad game. It delivers on some fun fights, a few cool RPG elements, and adds additional narrative which might have been lacking in the first Stalker. But like I said before, I was more than glad to put it behind me and move on to something new. Luckily, there was one title left to make my way through, and it proved to be my favorite of them all. Call of Pripyat is distinctly more modern in design compared to its predecessors. The maps are larger, the graphics are sharper, and the quests are... real. Like with plot and stuff. It seems to me that, straight from the beginning of the game, the devs wanted to make a point of this. There are surprise twists and interruptions, and more interesting objectives providing a level of substance that was distinctly missing in the prior titles. What starts as a simple artifact hunt evolves into a desperate shootout over the looted treasure. You might tackle a den of bloodsuckers alongside a partner, only to have the mission end with you sneaking through the heart of their nest, and then following up later by investigating a means of destroying them once and for all. In combination, I think this sort of approach to quest design is exactly what Stalker had always been lacking. The overworld finally leaves behind that older style, instead embracing a more sprawling, spacious design, while still offering those bestow dungeons and secret corners. To me, Call of Pripyat soon began to feel more like a prequel to Metro Exodus, the latest in the Metro series, rather than a sequel to the earlier Stalkers. I saw many reused concepts shared between the two, particularly in the way anomalies and enemies are distributed across the map. You just know that there's loot beyond those crackling orbs of electricity darting through the air, or fallen stalkers to be discovered in the deeper recesses of a mutant's cave. The core foundation had been maintained with the A-Life system, but due to these myriad gaming evolutions, the adventures you choose to take throughout this title became all the more your own. And with this many locations to explore, my prior complaints melted away. No longer could I describe the overworld as almost comically compact. In fact, as compared to the first two games, I could easily picture myself sinking quite a few hours into finding my way through this hostile environment, and more than once I was surprised by the unique encounters I was naturally led toward. The emission storms that were introduced in Clear Sky make a return in Call of Pripyat, but this time with a whole new ingenious technique to back them up. When you receive a warning that an emission is soon to arrive, your quest objective and marker immediately transition to take cover, 
and they provide a suggested position where you can do so on your minimap. In Clear Sky, these usually pointed you toward a faction base, which is likely where you were just coming from in the first place. In Call of Pripyat, however, you are directed towards some really cool dungeons and hidden quest encounters. Every emission is an opportunity for discovery, whereas before they were pretty annoying. This was a brilliant maneuver on the part of the devs, adapting a thematically strong but mechanically dismal component of the game and making it pay off in spades. Glorious. Now, these games are widely known for being a bit rough around the edges. Bugs and glitches are hey, relatively bro. common. I witnessed a few in the earlier games. Call of Pripyat, on the other hand, has proven to be a remarkably stable experience overall. Maybe it's because of the slightly modernized architecture the game was built atop, but I think it also speaks to the evidently higher budget and greater effort which was clearly poured into this game. Finally, all the improvements this series had garnered culminated into a single game. The distinct shooting, the improved map design, the RPG stuff, the quests, the narrative, Call of Pripyat delivers on them all in a big way. It feels like Stalker managed two generational leaps in one here. That isn't to say there are no peculiarities to make note of. While the objective markers are way better, there's still some rather obtuse requests made of you. Like when you need to kill a monolith captain in the midst of an ambush, only to discover after about 5 deaths and 20 minutes of non-stop battle against total bullet sponges, that said captain you're supposed to target stands on the corner of a rooftop about 20 stories above the fighting. Goddamn that guy. Still, these moments were seldom a real issue, and as I've noted, in general the quest design was a huge leap forward compared to the earlier entries, often delivering you to some great locales and gunfights. In fact, one of my favorite moments in the game involved exploring a huge abandoned facility in the middle of a pitch black night. There were very few enemies to be found in the immediate area, but the tense atmosphere and gradual exploration as I sought my way forward felt intensely rewarding. When designed this well, even the most subtle environmental puzzles become effortless, but in a way that makes you feel as though everything fell into place so naturally. There's an incredible sense of immersion as you explore the zone, with all the unknowns and uncertainties, the anomalies and mutants and bandits. It makes you wary of the zone and its daunting power, especially after the 20th reload in the past half hour. That's not to mention how Call of Pripyat still holds up graphically. Sure, the character models aren't quite the best anymore, and there's more than enough pop-in with all that foliage, but the interiors were clearly well ahead of their time. Sometimes I found it really hard to believe that this game released all the way back in 2010, and considering the pace of release between those first three games, it's all the more impressive. Stalker's ongoing legacy was established in the short span of about three years' time, a legacy I now consider to be well-deserved. Perhaps the greatest feeling Call of Pripyat instilled in me is a bit more hype for the upcoming Stalker 2. Because if it follows the trend set by the prior titles, this upcoming entry will continue to improve on all the things which makes these games special and further harness that unique atmosphere which has been beloved by fans for years and years following their release. Within our current selection of Stalker games, Call of Pripyat stands slightly above the rest in my opinion. If it's your intention to play through only a single one of these games, I would highly advise you choose the latest release above the prior two. Mostly due to a more modern design philosophy so far as gameplay is concerned, a better offering of complex quests, and generally improved stability. Whether you're a longtime fan of the series or a brand new Stalker just entering the zone for your first time, I hope you've appreciated my thoughts. Since you've made it this far, do us a huge favor and hit that like button. And if you really like our stuff, be sure to subscribe for more. Let us know about your adventures in the zone in the comments, and as always, thank you for watching.